One of the funniest things that I've ever seen is when a dog chases a rabbit. So I want you to imagine this scene. Here, here is your family dog. He's taking a nap in the backyard. He's just sleeping. He's just resting. And all of a sudden, he opens one eye and he sees just 20 feet away this rabbit. Instantly, the dog comes alive and he starts chasing after the rabbit as fast as he could go. But if you've ever watched a dog chase a rabbit, the rabbit is almost always faster and is quicker than the dog. The rabbit will dart this way and then he'll dart that way and he'll dart that way. And the dog will kind of do this and he'll make round corners. And all of a sudden, if you've ever watched this, they'll take off into the trees or into the field and they're gone. And you know inside of your mind that the dog is never going to catch the rabbit. But still, he pursues as long as he can with all the energy he has. And you just wait in the yard until finally, coming back into the yard is the dog, and his head is low, his ears are hanging low, and his tongue is hanging out, and he's just panting. <sighs> he's so tired because he spent the last 20 minutes chasing this rabbit that he never could catch. Sometimes we feel like the dog, where life is like a rabbit and it pursues and it runs and it darts here and there and we say, I just wish I could catch up once in a while. We pursue this and we pursue that and we get so busy and life gets so complicated we say, I can never catch up. Sometimes we feel like the rabbit. We say, I wasn't bothering anybody and all of a sudden this is chasing me and this is chasing me. And I feel this pressure all of the time to try to stay ahead of the troubles that are coming. So the analogy of the dog and the rabbit has application to both of us. But the, the, the point behind it all is a statement that I would like to make to you, and it's this. What I pursue determines where I end up. What I pursue determines where I end up. If I want to pursue money, if I want to pursue beauty, if I want to pursue security, if I pursue importance, if I pursue relationships or friends, if I want to pursue a degree at a university or good grades, if I pursue those things, that path is going to probably determine where I end up. The key is to know which one of those things I should chase and I should go after. But there's a second point that I'd like to leave with you. How I pursue those things determines how fruitful the journey will be. It's not just what I pursue, but how I pursue it. How I pursue the things in my life determine how fruitful I will be. When we come to the letter again called 1 Timothy, we're now coming near the end, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and today verses 11 through 16, Paul is going to talk to Timothy about the pursuit of various things. He's talked about the dangers in the previous section of relationships and dissensions that are centered around the false teaching and how that can steer us off of the path of godliness. And then when we last talked, he said that pursuit of financial gain in the name of Jesus Christ, but pursuing financial gain, he said that's going to steer us away from the gospel message too. So in this section, he says, Timothy, this is what I want you to pursue. This is what I want you to run after. This is what you should be doing with your time and with your energy and what you instruct your churches. See, what he wants to tell him is that, Timothy, I can tell you what to pursue or in this case, who to pursue, that's Jesus Christ. But what does that look like in life, in your church, in your community, in your gospel witness? Because where you're going to end up is going to be very significant if you're pursuing the right things. Timothy, this life is not going to be easy. But if you pursue the things of God and the things of the gospel, he says, I, God will give you peace. He will give you rest. He will give you security. Timothy, you're going to be tired. You're going to be exhausted. You're going to get weary of running the race. But he says, in your heart, I can give you, God can give you rest. He can give you security. But how to figure out what to pursue, that was the challenge. And he gives Timothy some very practical, very personal advice as to how he should follow Jesus Christ. 
So take your Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 through 16. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 through 16, and it says this, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Now the first question to answer, the, the first answer to the first question of how I am to follow him is that I need to follow him actively, not passively. I need to follow Jesus Christ and his path actively, not passively. You see, this was one of Timothy's problems. He was timid, he was shy, he was a bit sickly, and so his tendency would be to sit back and be in his fear or in his insecurity say, I, I don't think I can do that. I don't know if I want to do that. Paul is saying, Timothy, you can't sit back passively. You must push forward actively and aggressively. I look at the first words of verse 11. He says, but as for you, O man of God, I want you to contrast that with the way that this letter began. When Paul addressed Timothy as my true child of the faith, a term of endearment, a, a term of love, a term of familiarity, but now by the end of the letter, with these strong admonitions, he says to Timothy, as for you, no longer does he call him a child of, the faith, uh, of his faith. He says, O man of God, Timothy, rise up. You're a man of God. You're a warrior. You're a leader of these churches. I know you feel insecure, but you must take the lead. You must take charge. And then he gives them this, these specific instructions. He says, first of all, flee these things. Run away from these things. What things? Whenever you have a statement like this, you say, what does the context say? When he says these things, you would look backwards to what he's just talked about. So these things could include most immediate context, the pursuit of financial gain. Timothy, don't spend all of your time pursuing financial gain. That's not why you're here. You could go back a little bit further to, to verses 3 through 5 or verses 3 through 6. Don't pursue relationships that get di um, divided because of false doctrine. Don't pursue those things that will lead you away from the gospel. Timothy, you must always be sure to run away from those things. And I think that word flee is such a great word. To run away from. We give instructions to our children from time to time. One of the dangers that uh, we're always afraid of, but rarely has it ever happened, is maybe a ch uh, one of our children is playing outside in the front yard. And a stranger drives by in a car. And this is the tactic that they will sometimes use. Hey, little boy, would you come here? I've lost my dog. Would you come and help me find my dog? And because children love animals and love pets, they'll say, oh, mister, I'll help you find your dog. And they get in the car. And sometimes that person is an evil person and they will kidnap that child. So we tell our children, if someone ever comes up to you and says, would you come with me and help me find my puppy? my dog or my cat, you don't talk to them, you don't argue with them, you don't negotiate with them, you run away from them. Because they are not there to help you or to have you help them, they are there to capture you. Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, you must run away from these things that would drag you away from the gospel. I, I think of a broader application, I think of Joseph. You remember he was taken into captivity in Egypt. And Potiphar, he was serving in Potiphar's household, and Potiphar was gone, and 
Potiphar's wife tried to seduce Joseph. Day after day, she would come up, Joseph, come with me. Let's have a little fun. Let's have a little pleasure. And Joseph would say, no, I cannot do dishonor. And finally, the day came when she said, the house is empty. The servants are gone. Come with me, Joseph. Let's have a little pleasure. Let's indulge in our pleasures or our lusts. And he runs away. She grabs his tunic, his, his jacket, and, and it rips off him, and he runs away. He gets caught, and she accuses him of things, but his integrity was intact. He had run away. That There are times when we should engage in battle, and there are times when we simply need to run away. Paul says, when, when the gospel is being perverted by those who would offer a different gospel, and when trouble is being perverted, Timothy, you must flee things. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and value your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. He gives his second command. He says, flee these things, but next, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, God, gentleness. He says, Timothy, there are some things that I want you to pursue. I want you to run after them. I want you to, to, to look for them. I want you to gather them because they're so helpful. There are some evil things, some distracting things you must run away from, but there are some things you must run after. When I began to date my wife, I found her attractive, and she was a number of years younger than me, and so I wasn't sure if she was going to like me. But So we started dating for a little bit, and, and I was pursuing her. I, I wanted to pursue her attention. I wanted to pursue her love because there was something that drew me to her that said she is a special woman. Maybe one day she could even be my wife, and I pursued her. That word is to go after to strive after, to strain after, because it's worthy of pursuit. And look at the list of things that he says to pursue. Pursue righteousness. In fact, these things go in couplets. Righteousness and godliness. It, righteousness is the horizontal. Godliness is the vertical. Righteousness is something that people can see in you. They observe your godly behavior. But the godliness part is the vertical relationship with God. He says, I want you to pursue a righteous relationship that even people can see and a godly relationship that God looks at your heart and he says, yes, he's in right relationship with me. The next two, faith and love. Faith is dependability. Faith is trustworthiness. Love is not, love, love is not the mushy feeling that I had for my wife as I was falling in love. Love in the Bible, especially this word, is self-sacrificing love. It says, I will say no to my desires and yes to, to please you, to help you, to equip you, to love you. He says, Timothy, I want you to pursue faith, dependability, trustworthiness. I want you to pursue love. I want you to pursue the kind of love that gives. It doesn't try to take. A few years ago, my wife was planning this little birthday party for our children and and, and for one of our children, excuse me. And she was all stressed out because she had plans. She wanted to get the house clean. She wanted to prepare this special cake and prepare for guests. But the day before this birthday party was supposed to happen, she had uh, bags of laundry to be folded. She had washed them in the washing machine, but had not had time to fold them. It also happened to be the time when our garden was producing its vegetables, peas, and beans, and we love peas and beans in our family. So here was buckets full of peas and beans, and she's, she's wondering to herself, how am I ever gonna get all this work done so that we can have this birthday party at our house? So I come home from my day at church, and I'm tired, and, and I've been working and engaging with people and studying, and I, all I wanna do is just sit down and maybe watch some television in the evening. And all of a sudden, I pick up this, we call it a vibe, a sensation. From my wife. Men, when you get married, you understand this, but there, sometimes our wives don't even need to use words to communicate with us. I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden I realize 
My wife is not happy. My wife is not content. And so I say, what's wrong? And she says, I have all this work to do. I have beans to prepare for canning. I have peas to shell. I have clothes to fold. I want to get the house clean. And the children are running here and there. And I can't get all this work done. And all of a sudden, just blah, she tells me all about these problems. At that point, I have a choice. I could say, I'm tired, I worked hard, I'm going to sit here and watch television. If I do that, I will have a very unhappy wife. So in my mind, I say, my love for her means that I will sacrifice for her. So I got up. And I began to help with the children. Got little Sasha off to bed first because she was the youngest. I got the boys off to bed. And so they were in bed. And then I, I was getting more tired. It's now late at night. And I say, I can help with the beans. And, and when we can beans, we snip off each end of the bean. And then we cut the beans. The green, the green beans are about this long. We cut off each end, and then we cut them in little sections about this long, and then we prepare them for canning so that we have vegetables for the winter. I did that all the time she is working. Why did I do that? I wanted to sit on the couch and watch television and rest. Instead, I helped with the children. I helped with the vegetables. Why did I do that? Love. Not just affection, not just, um, um, not just the kind of mushy, gushy kind of love we have when we're dating, but the kind of love that says, I will sacrifice my wants and my desires for you. And so Paul says to Timothy, I want you to pursue that. Timothy, you're tired. You're feeling sick. But Timothy, you must pursue love out of this kind of a heart. And then there's one more couplet, steadfastness and gentleness, or endurance and gentleness. Endurance that says, I won't quit. I will keep on going. At the, at the time that I'm teaching this class, there is a famous bicycle race going on in France called the Tour de France. Maybe you've heard of it. There are some American riders in it. There may be some Russian riders in it, but there's one particular rider that is not in first place. He's not doing very well this year, but he has won seven times this race. His name is Lance Armstrong. I have admired him for many years. He had cancer, and they thought he would never race again, and he was cured of his cancer, and he came back, and he began exercise, and he began training, and he entered one race, and he did okay, and the next year, I think it was, he won, and then he won, and he won, and he kept winning year after year. But this bicycle race is one of the most difficult athletic events in the world. They travel about 2,000 miles over 21 days, I think it is. I, I know I mentioned this the other day. And as I was watching on the computer, I, I couldn't watch the race, but I was checking on the computer yesterday, and they were running a stage in the Pyrenees Mountains enormous mountains and you could follow along as they were traveling and, and one of their race paths took them up this very steep mountain they have categories of climbs a like category one or category two this particular mountain was they, they call the category beyond category it's so steep and it's so severe that just to make it to the top is a test of endurance and lance armstrong did not win that stage yesterday but in previous in previous races, he has won, when he was younger, he won those stages because he had incredible lung capacity. He had incredible leg strength from incredible training. He ate right. He, he exercised severely so that he could win this race. That's what he's talking about with this word steadfastness. You must endure, Timothy, for the gospel of Jesus Christ, for the glory of God, for the health of the church. But he said, Timothy, along with this endurance, you must be gentle. Sometimes, especially for us men, and I'm very competitive. And when I play basketball, I'm very competitive. I like to play, and I like to play hard, even though I'm getting old and I can't play as fast and jump as high. I'm still competitive. But he says, Timothy, along with your endurance, I want you to be gentle. 
I don't want you to be known as harsh. I don't want you to be known as someone who is rough. I want you to be known as someone who is gentle. It, it means a mildness of disposition that willingly accepts God's dealings with us for our own good, but a mildness of disposition. I would say that my wife has that kind of disposition, that there is a gentleness about her that sometimes I don't have. It says, Timothy, along with your endurance, along with your perseverance and your steadfastness, I want you to, I want you to do that. So, Timothy, I want you to pursue these things. Don't give up. Don't quit. Keep running after them. And when you do, you're going to find a very balanced Christian life, the pursuit of these things. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.